Okay, so um, welcome back, everybody. So today we talk about Nietzsche, and uh, this was your first time with Nietzsche, so we're again going to take a poll and <laughs> see what were your impressions of Nietzsche. Uh, so let's see, from a scale from 1 to 10, I'm going to put you in gallery view. Any 10s for Nietzsche? Just put your hand out. Okay, as expected. <laughs> Any 9s? 8. Okay, Rodriguez, 7. All right, few more. 6. Five, sing. Four, three, two, one. Two is Campbell. One for Trujillo. <laughs> Zero. Okay, let's start with the haters. Let's start with Trujillo and Campbell. Tell us a little bit what happened. <laughs> I I gave it a low number because it was a little confusing. But from what I could understand from it. I feel like the, the view of Christianity that he may have had is not the same view, like, for everyone else. It's like, I'm a Christian, so my experience is a little bit different. Though I understood his perspective, because I can see it both ways, but my perspective was a little bit different. And I feel like it just didn't give no, like, no sense of there may be another perspective or, like, understanding of it. Yes, he's uh, delivering his perspective, <laughs> right? He's not a postmodern in that sense, right? So, um, so yeah, it is. It does sound like a very personal attack, right? Coming from a very, very personal place. It's not an objective, right? He's not being objective. Uh, he's being very subjective. Uh, so yes, you're right. Good impression. You, you, you caught, and, and that is problematic, perhaps, in philosophy, since we expect people to be objective, right? So very good, um, Campbell. Uh, Trujillo, do you want to add? Yes, I wanted to say that um, we had, even he killed us at the Christianity, but we had to understand also the time that he was, he was living on. So uh, we had to understand that, and we don't even know how was his life, how, was the, how did he live at that period of time with Christianity? So he was he was expressing his um, his thoughts about Christianity, but he treated us so badly. <laughs> yes, yes, we have to know the background, right? And and we'll talk yeah. about it a little bit. Yeah, remember, right? Nietzsche. I don't know if I said this in the introduction. Yes, you did say it was on eighteen ninety four. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, what I didn't say, I think, is that Nietzsche was somebody who, who had firsthand experience of suffering, right? He was very sick for, for most of his life, actually. And when he, when he was faced with Christianity, the issue he has, why he's so personal, right, is that instead of Christianity offering him an answer to his suffering, Christianity avoids the question altogether of suffering, right? Christianity, we're going to see today, chooses to escape the issue. Christianity refuses, at least the Christianity he's used to, right, is refusing to face life and to address what's going on. Christianity, on the contrary, just escapes into alternative world, right? So that's where Nietzsche, you can sense it's a disappointment, right? He was expecting more. He was expecting some kind of serious answer. Instead, he gets this kind of wishy-washy escapist uh, route, right? So maybe that's where his aggressivity is coming from, right? He's, he's disappointed, personally disappointed, <laughs> right? Uh, very good. Uh, he compares, sorry. He also compares suffering with pity. Uh, yes, yes. Um, yes so. What, so, what was your question about that? Uh, because he said that suffering is kind of contagious. Uh, so. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about pity in a second, um, because that's an issue where many people stumble, right? Why does he, why does he yeah. have like pity, right? Why yeah. does he go against pity? Um, so actually, let me ask the class, right? Why do you think pity is, what's wrong with pity? Let's talk. There's a difference between pity, actually, and compassion. What is the difference between pity and compassion? Anybody know? Um, I actually agreed with him. I feel pity is a wasted emotion, even self-pity, right? It could be, um, there is, there's a big difference between if you empathize with someone's suffering, 
perhaps, and perhaps try to place yourselves in their shoes rather than pity is probably coming from a place of a moral high ground. That's how I saw it. Like, oh, I pity this person. And, and perhaps he saw, this is one of the places he saw no solution from Christianity. There, that's not a solution. Excellent. Um, uh, excellent, right? You say it very well. Pity comes from a moral high ground. In other words, when you pity someone, you feel that you feel bad for them because they're so low, <laughs> right? And so in, in, a, in a way, it's humiliating right, to the other person, your pity, right? You're looking at them like, ew, I wouldn't want to be, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in that position, poor thing. And so the pity actually shifts the person you're looking at to a low level, right? Whereas compassion is, I've been there, I've been through what you've been through, and I feel for you because I've been there. So there's more equality with compassion. I, compassion is a feeling I have when I've been there too. So I'm not looking down, I'm, kind of living with, right, the other person. So that's the, the, the issue of pity. And Christianity has this approach of constantly pitying, that is to say, according to Nietzsche, make someone low, <laughs> right? So and that's, that's what, I, I'm sorry. So that's what he, um, I think he is talking about, that Christianity sees pity as a virtue. Yeah, and it's not, right? Oh, and it's not, right. So maybe it's a virtue, the compassion. It could yeah, be a, he prefers that aspect of compassion. Yes, okay. Because that one I think that I, I agree with. Okay, very good, very good. But we, I will keep on one more point, maybe three. <laughs> yeah, you have one more point? No, you good? <laughs> okay, let's look at the lovers. Who was there, or any questions you might have? Who wants to add for perhaps to what uh, Trujillo has said, or, or who wants to talk about uh, the pros of Nietzsche? <laughs> I'm gonna say I was one of the lovers. So I actually, I almost felt like he, it was, his language was provocative <laughs> and that was intentional. It almost felt like he wants to jolt the reader out of um, conforming. Like he's a non-conformist. And it was almost, you know, I considered some of it probably, maybe it is the way he feels, but probably, hyperbolic, it was exaggerated language, it was broad sweeping statements, it was just basically like, yep, this is it. And almost to make the reader uncomfortable, like shake you like, and, and have an opinion, right? He wants the reader to have an opinion. That's how I felt, and I actually, that's how I read it through that lens. I actually took your advice and read it through the lens of, oh, he's a stand-up comedian, and he really wants to make the room uncomfortable here. Very good, right? Yes, and Singh adds to that, right? Singh is saying, I agree, he definitely had an instigating attitude. Yeah, we have to understand, Nietzsche is not only bashing Christianity, he's bashing philosophy in many of his texts, right? This approach that you have to be rational and calm and collected and objective, and there's no room for emotion, there's no room for anger, there's no room for passion. This is also something that he criticizes, right? This kind of, you know, cold, detached approach to reality, he says, is not gonna give us reality, right? If you're looking at reality objectively with a cold, detached reason, you're not gonna access reality. Reality is not accessed like that. Reality is accessed through the body, emotionally, you feel and you are in a way provoked, you're, you're, you're moved, right, by what is going on around you and that's how you know your surroundings, by how your surroundings move you, right? So he's also, the reason why he's not making a nice philosophical argument, clear-cut, rational, uh, also, you know, objective, cool and collected, is that he doesn't think this is the right approach to life. Right, this kind of distance, you know, Anglo-Saxon <laughs> right, approach. He's saying this is not this is not how you enter life correctly. Right, you enter life full-bodied with all your passions. You are connected to uh, how you feel. Right, and so this is also why he's writing like he's writing right on purpose, being hyper-emotional uh, as as a way to explode the narrow categories of philosophical thought, right? Does that make sense? Uh, anybody have anything more to say before we go in the lecture? Um, I just feel like reading him, he sounds like a little bitter, so. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there was something that he mentioned where he's like, he compares us to like animals, 
and not 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 in the sense that we're like beastly or anything like that, but that that we all can like attain like the same kind of perfection, which I didn't necessarily agree with at all. I mean, like I do feel like there is sort of like a hierarchy when it comes to like the different um like, I mean beings of life and stuff. So like I don't know, like his his view was just not it wasn't it for me. I was just like no. And then he talks about like morality and stuff like that, and how about like the end of life. And I was like, I mean, we all, whether you believe in like believe in God or not, like that morality doesn't come. It doesn't stem from God. It just comes from like the like, the code of living. Uh, maybe I misinterpreted it. I don't really know. But like his views were just really, like they were just not. They were just not what I thought whatsoever. And be careful, right? He's not, he's not so much expressing views as reacting to an experience, right? Nietzsche is not trying to teach us anything, right? Nietzsche is just telling us, here's how what I've experienced, here's how I feel about it. Now tell me, is this true or not, right? Am I really seeing this correctly? Remember, Nietzsche has an experience with Christianity, right? He's, he's, he's been there, he's grown up in that context, and that's and he's experienced it through a certain lens, and that's what he's reacting to, that lens, right? So one yeah. of the ways to respond to Nietzsche is to open his lens, right? Which is what I'm gonna do at the end of class. We're gonna try to open a little bit his lens. He has a, he has a particular lens on Christianity where he's seeing, and it's, there is, and he's right, he's seeing correctly through that lens, but there is more, right? And that's what we have to begin to say. But what he is seeing, and this is, I'm gonna emphasize this and, and stand my ground on this, he's right. Whatever he's saying through this narrow lens is really an accurate description of, of an aspect of Christianity. Certainly Christianity has fallen into that. But like, I, like I'm going to show at the end of class, there is more to Christianity than what he's seeing. And that's the Yeah, I, was, I agree with Trujillo because she was saying like it's relative to his time period. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like no religion remains the same throughout since when it's like been like sprouted or anything like that it's always changed paths throughout like this and yeah. stuff so i was saying this has to be like relative like relative towards its time i was like because right now it's not a good time. well in my opinion at least <laughs> to a certain degree yes okay very good all right let's get into the text um we're gonna go and uh, look at page for the first hour page 52 and um and the outline will be there will be two i'm going to talk about two things the the destruction of passions and then number two, the spiritualization of passion. The spiritualization of passions, of the passions, okay? So that's, yeah, so turn with me, page 52, where he says morality is anti-nature. Before I get into that text, let, let me summarize briefly uh, what I've said before about what he's gonna do in this work, what we're gonna be exploring. Um, Remember, uh, with Nietzsche, there's going to be two main criticisms, which we'll explore in the first and the second hour, right? So make sure you write this down. Number one criticism is the notion that Christianity is anti-life. In other words, Christianity despises life, despises the world, right? This uh, very similar to kind of how Job was seeing the world, right? Life is full of sin, life is full of corruption, life is you know, the world is constantly, we should abandon the world. And, and I mean, he's not wrong when he says this, right? There is a strong tradition in, in Christianity, uh, I think across the board, not only Catholicism, but Protestantism, where the world is seen as a place that we should avoid, like a back alley, right? Be not of the world, right? Uh, we forget that Jesus also said, be in the world, <laughs> right? We focus on be not of the world. And you have this attitude of Christianity that the world is a big sinful place that we need to avoid at all costs, right? And we need to live on the margins as much as possible. So there is really, and we're going to talk a little more about that when we talk about the passions, there is a, a negative view of the world, a negative view of life. Um, we see this. Um, um, in, in the way that the church uh, for many, for many years uh, has said, we, we need to be, we need to live outside, right? We need to withdraw. And monasticism, right? The monks, the nuns, which are the highest version of Christianity are really doing that. They are withdrawing from the world, living in cloisters, right? They are cut off from family, from, you know, uh, partners, uh, from everything. They're by, right? This is the ideal. 
I mean, if you look at the highest ideal of Christianity and you look at the highest officials, they're monks, <laughs> right? At least in Catholicism, right? They're monks who have chosen to withdraw it. So, so Nietzsche is looking at that and he's saying, why such a hatred against the world and life, <laughs> right? And so we'll look at that, right? So in that sense, he says Christianity is nihilistic, right? Because it hates life. Nihilistic, when he says nihilistic, he means a hatred of life of the world, right? Um, so that's the first point we're gonna see in the first half. Second point, he says Christianity is delusional, <laughs> right? It, it has, instead of facing suffering head on, right? Instead of really addressing the problem of suffering, Christianity uh, goes around it elegantly and says, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're going through here. What matters is the afterlife. And don't worry, the more you suffer now, the higher your status in the afterlife. So this is really, for Nietzsche, it's not a serious answer. This is not a serious answer which has the courage to look at life in the face and to look at suffering in the face. This is an answer which avoids the problem altogether, right? And so, and he's right again, right? Christianity has for centuries, right, preached to people, you are suffering now, but it doesn't matter. What matters is the afterlife. Uh, don't ask questions. God knows why he put you in that situation, right? Don't, don't rebel against your condition, right? Um, and, and so Nietzsche is, is, is annoyed, frustrated, right? At this uh, uh, attitude. But so, so what he's seeing in those two points, you can see that these are elements that you can find in Christianity. Now, I'm gonna argue that Christianity is broader, but whatever he's seeing with his narrow, you know, through the keyhole, he's seeing correctly. These are, these are two of the biggest pitfalls, traps that Christianity has fallen into, right? And this is, is due, we're going to see, not because so much because of the teachings of Jesus, but because of the infiltration of Greek philosophy into Christianity. We're going to talk about that, right? So this is going to be my way out. So make sure you write this down, right? The main, what Nietzsche is criticizing, these two issues, these two problems, delusional and nihilistic, these are not stemming. When you look at the teachings of Jesus, when you read the Gospels, you don't find that, right? This is a later uh, development in Christianity under the influence of Greek thought, which has led Christianity towards in that direction. So really what Nietzsche, what I'm going to argue, what Nietzsche is criticizing is the Greek elements of Christianity, not so much the uh, actual, right? Okay, so we'll get to that in due time. All right, so let's begin with uh, point one, right, which is uh, the text on page 52, which, um, which will be dealing with the issue of nihilism, the way that Christianity is anti-life, right? And so Chris, uh, Nietzsche focuses in this text on what he calls the passions, right? So we need to define these really quick before we get in the text so we can find our way. Uh, and then we need to see how the, uh, what Christianity has done with the passions and why this is anti-life according to Nietzsche, right? So first of all, what is a passion? So write this down. Actually, I'm going to uh, put it in the chat also, right? Passion is an overwhelming feeling uh, which uh, in response to something in the world. That's a passion, right? Passion is not something that occurs by yourself, you know, in your mind, right? Or in your heart. Passion is a reaction. It's a response to something in the world, right? So, for example, you see somebody who's very attractive, passion, right? You feel, you fall in love. Or you see something that makes you super angry, right? You see a gross injustice, passion. You feel angry, right? You see, um, you see some, somebody oppressing, uh, uh, people of your race or of your religion, now you feel pride for your race and your religion because that is a response. I need to mm, affirm myself, right, through the pride so that I can overcome this demeaning attitude of others towards my religion or my race or my ethnicity, right? So, uh, so yes, Rufio, a passion is a, it's not just a feeling, it's an overwhelming feeling, right? Uh, and, and, you're, you, you, and you cannot usually control it. It's hard to control. Right, so, so that's, that's what a passion is. So a passion is an overwhelming feeling that, that is coming from something in, in life around us, right? Something, it's as though life is calling something out of us, right? A passion really, when you feel a passion, it is, it is the symptom or the sign that life is calling you towards it, whether it's calling you um, 
to, um, to receive something, to take something, uh, to take action, right? A passion is usually connected. It's, 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 it's a way, it's the way that life moves you, right? Let me say that again. A passion is the way that life moves you to be angry or, uh, or to feel strong desire or to feel, uh, <clears throat> what are some of these other passions? <laughs> uh, or to or to take action right so uh so this is really what we're talking about with passion now you can see that if you start to demonize these passions what you're really doing is what yes what are you really doing when you start as the church has done to demonize these strong emotions which are natural reactions to the world around us right uh, and in fact, the church has done this. Now, before we talk about the problem, let's see what the church has done with these passions. So the church has actually changed, uh, has, has, has made a list of passions and has transformed them into sins. Any of you familiar with the seven deadly sins? Those are seven deadly passions. Let's write down the seven deadly sins. What are they? Okay, sloth. <laughs> what else? Greed, lust, anger. Gluttony, one, two, three, four, five. There needs two more. Envy, pride, okay? One, two, three, seven. Okay, make sure you're ready. So, so these are seven passions, right? Which Christianity has transformed into sins. Sloth is a laziness, right? So these are seven, and, and look at them. Let's try to look at them without the, 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 the kind of... Uh, demonic uh, or, or uh, negative connotation that they have in Christianity, right? Look at these seven passions and see how there are seven ways of responding to the world, right? You have, suppose, um, you know, you see something attractive. Now you're lusting after it, or you see some, or you have a goal that you have to achieve, or you see somebody succeed very well. Now you have greed, right, to, to get there. You, you see, um, um, again, the notion of pride, right? You see the oppression of your brothers and sisters. Now you feel pride, right? To affirm yourself. Uh, any, uh, uh, last anger, okay, you see some good food, okay, gluttony, right? You see something you want to have. And do you see how these are seven ways to react that the world is calling us out of ourselves to move towards something else, right? Um, now, uh, and this is in itself is innocent, right? You see something in the world that's, that, that catches your attention and it moves you, right? In itself, the fact that the world moves us, the fact that the world catches our attention, that life is calling us towards more than what we have, in itself is natural part of being human. Now, the problem what Nietzsche is seeing is that Christianity has taken these seven fundamental powerful passions and turned them into sin. And deadly sins at that, right? So now they're called sloth, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, and pride. And what Nietzsche is saying is that this is problematic. The way that Christianity is demonizing natural uh, passions of hum human beings is deeply problematic. Now, can anyone tell me why? Why is Nietzsche so, so uh, disappointed with Christianity that it has demonized these natural passions? How is this dangerous? I think he um, wanted freedom, less confinement, and people to express themselves and be more free. Yeah, so first of all, the passions have to do with us entering life, right? The passions are an invitation to enter life, right? And, and Nietzsche wants to take the invitation. He doesn't want to be forbidden. Right, so make sure you write this down, right? In many ways, the passions is life inviting us into itself, is, is the created world, right? Inviting us to move forward. These, and Nietzsche wants the freedom to enter life, right? And Christianity has just put a huge obstacle by saying, ah, 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 these are sins. Don't touch that, don't eat that, don't look at that, don't do that, don't feel that. This is the problem, right? And you're constant. Okay, let me give you an example. You you've seen the horrible movie uh, with Keanu Reeves, uh, uh, Devil's Advocate. Let me see how many of you have seen that. How many of you have seen Devil's Advocate with Keanu Reeves and uh, what's his face, Al Pacino? 
It's an old movie, kind of. No, who, who saw it? One person? Just me? I'm the only one? Me and Rodriguez. Okay, it's our generation. <laughs> okay, so never mind. It's not that great of a movie, but in the movie, you have the devil talking and explaining. Why would God create all these beautiful things and make you desire them and then tell you, no, it's forbidden? That's what Nietzsche is. That's his point, right? We have, there's all this stuff in the world that we are moved towards. And then Christianity comes along and says, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't touch, don't look, don't see, don't want, don't desire, don't feel, right? And Nietzsche is frustrated, right? He's saying, this is, this is natural to being human, to want to touch and feel and taste and, and desire, right? And so, okay, so there was another response in the chat. Um, yeah, so Sly says, right, that's what makes life life, right? This is, um, passions are life calling us, right? To follow your passion is to enter life, right? If you follow the desire of your, or of your eyes or the desire of your heart, and if you feel, you know, ambitious and you want to achieve that goal or have that house or you desire that person or you're angry at that injustice or you're proud to be who you are in the face of oppression, that's you entering life. And, and, and Nietzsche is saying, see, by demonizing these passions, what Christianity is doing is putting a wall between us and life. Okay, make sure you write this down. That's really the problem, right? By demonizing these passions, which are life calling us, Christianity is basically saying no entry, don't enter here, don't enter life. Right, and we are exactly where the book of Job left us. Right, remember, Job was afraid to enter life, and that was precisely what God addressed when He did His famous speech and His, you know, when He painted His landscape. He was saying to Job, "Stop, stop thinking that I am, that I have put a sign of no entry in front of life. Enter, for God's sake!" Right. So this is what Nietzsche, Nietzsche is very close to Job in this sense, right? Since he's saying, why, we, why is there a no entry sign here? I want to live. This is my world. I want to enter. I want to follow the desires of my heart. Why not? Right? Okay. Do you follow a little more now the problematic um, uh, 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 gesture of Christianity when they put a no entry sign? Um... I just want to add, just, it's, it's kind of like a yes and no, um, which like, I do agree, like, you should not, not be able to live life, but then again, it's like, when you're raised, and like, and you go to like, Catholic school, and stuff like that, they just tell you that like, your life is not supposed to be guided by temptation, and that's why these sins are so deadly, because you're tempted to like, kind of like, act out on those seven deadly sins, so like, I understand from like, the Christian point of view, but then I also understand him too, because it's like, you can't live your life without temptation. You know what I'm saying? Like you want to try to do things, but it's just like, how far would that temptation drive you? So it does go kind of like both ways. It's interesting what you say. You say we shouldn't be tempted. Why use that word? Why not? See, that's the issue that Nietzsche is pointing out. Why are these temptations? <laughs> right? Why are they not simply invitations? Right? Temptation means that at the other end, there's something bad. And what Nietzsche is saying is no. At the other end, there's something good. This is not a temptation. This is an invitation. Temptation comes from the notion that life is corrupt and evil. And therefore, it's out there like a seductress tempting you, <laughs> right? But if you take life as inherently pure and innocent and good, then if life is calling at you, it's not temptation, right? It's an invitation. Do you follow me, Cancino? No, yeah, I agree. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I follow temptation, you know what I'm saying? Like, screw it. But, don't but like, it, don't call it but I, like, you know, like, I, I do engage in, like, wanting to, like, explore the world. So, like, I do understand that. But it's just, like, at the same time when, like, you're raised to believe that you do kind of think, like, ugh, like, it, it does have a very negative connotation. So, like, exactly. I, it's, it's easy to see both sides. And the, the problem with that is that that's because Christianity views life as inherently evil right? That's the problem. When life, when the created world is viewed as inherently evil, then anything that calls from there is a temptation. Nietzsche is saying, why are we viewing life as inherently evil? Why not see life as inherently good so that when it calls out to us, 
it's not a temptation, it's an invitation, right? Does everybody understand the distinction? This is very important. If you can understand what I'm saying here, how many understand that what I'm saying, the distinction between the problem, right? The root of the problem is the view on the created world, is the view on life. Christianity views life as inherently sinful and evil because of the story of the fall and the way that, you know, you know the story, Adam and Eve were expelled out of the good garden into the bad world, <laughs> right? And now everything is bad. Everything is out to get us. And so anytime the world is kind of pulling, you know, pulling on us, it's seen as a temptation. Whereas Nietzsche is saying, no, life is good. Life is, he's very close to the God's speech, right? The way that he sees the world as powerful, wild, untamable, risky business, but at the same time ecstatic. It's very similar when you read some of the texts of Nietzsche on, on happiness, right? when he talks about leaving behind comfortableness in order to experience all of life, the highs and the lows, the ecstasies and the, you know, the pits, right? He's talking about reality as inherently good. And that's why for him, life calling to us, beckoning us is seen as something positive, right? Okay, good. So we got that. Uh, we're moving slowly. <laughs> never going to finish. Okay. Uh, there were a couple more uh, observations in the chat. Um, so, yeah, uh, so let me, uh, so Job, of course, um, just to answer De La Torre and then Simone, right? Uh, Job's in the prologue has no desires. <laughs> He's entirely castrated. You see him, how afraid he is. Even his children are having a party. No, something might go wrong, right? So Job has not allowed himself to have desires, right? It's later in the dialogues that you see Job erupted, right? In anger, in, in, uh, and these are passions, right? Job becomes passionate, right? Okay, uh, and then Simone, you were saying, uh, he isn't angry in general, just yes, he's mainly angry, yes, because he's, uh, Nietzsche loves life, right? He's not angry at life, he's angry at how Christianity has barred us entry into life. That's the main issue, right? Make sure you write this down, right? Nietzsche is mostly, he's not angry at life, he loves life, right? But he's angry at how Christianity have barred, let me write this word down, right? Have barred the entry into life. That's what he's angry about, okay? So, okay. And the passions are these invitations from life, right? Uh, to, 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 to take a stand or to act or to take or to receive or to move in this direction, right? Okay, so um, yes, so that's in essence the issue, right? So let's look now at the text so we can, um, uh, now you have the main argument, now you can look a little, you can understand maybe the text a little more. Let's go to page 52, uh, where he's talking about morality as anti-nature. Everybody there? Let me make sure everybody's there. Wave at me if you're there. Yes, okay, great, all right. So let's start with the title. Morality is anti-nature. Already we can understand this, right? What does the title mean based on everything I told you? <laughs> Why is morality anti-nature? See if you remember anything I said. Basically saying that these moral principles that are being taught in Christianity go against everything against our human nature go against our human instincts our human nature is not allowing us to basically what you just said live life right excellent right it goes against not only life but what it means to be human right and this is where nietzsche is also frustrated because for him why is it that to reach some kind of spiritual maturity i have to give up my humanity why why can't I reach God from within my humanity? And by the way, this is what Job learned, right? Job found God when he found his humanity, not before. It wasn't until Job became deeply human, right? Emotional, confused, right? And lost and so forth that he started to have a clearer vision of God, right? So very, a lot of similarities right here between jo the message of Job, right? Not Job, but the message of Job and, and Nietzsche, what he's saying, right? So that's the issue, right? It's, it go why is it that to reach God, I have to shed my human nature and become some kind of, you know, asexual angel, right? Why? Why can't I find God within my humanity? So yes, absolutely. Right, I saw a couple as another response. Uh, he imposes an unnatural way of life, 
right? Absolutely. We are supposed to constantly wear a straight jacket and we're not allowed to be fully human if we want to be a Christian. This is the problem, right? Why is it that to be a Christian, I have to leave behind my humanity? Why is it that to be a Christian, I have to wear a straight jacket? Why? That's his question, right? Okay. Can everybody hear the plane going by? <laughs> I'm just wondering, who hears the plane going by? Ah, <laughs> yes, uh, I live close to LaGuardia and I'm blessed with <laughs> this constant <laughs> um, going of planes around my house. Okay, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's go into the text. Okay, so, all right, so I'm reading from the beginning. There's a time with all passion. So, by the way, when he begins here, he actually uh, agrees with Christianity, right? He's, he's going to say, um, he agrees that passions can be dangerous, just like Christianity does, right? So he says, there's a time with all passions when they are merely fatalities. So he says, yes, some of these desires, some of these overpowering desires can kill you, right? If you become obsessed with another human being and you have to have them, you can, it's not going to go well with you. Right? If you become obsessed with money and you have to have money, this is, it's going to destroy you. So, so he agrees that's, that these powerful emotions, if they're not, uh, not, not repressed or controlled, but if they're not, if you cannot navigate them, right, they can cause our death. Right? So he agrees there with Christianity of the danger of the passions. Right? So he says there is a time with all passions when they're merely fatalities. Fatalities, that means it can lead you to death when they drag their victim down with the weight of their folly and so forth. And so then he continues a uh, second line uh, sentence. Formerly, he says, one made war on passion. So now he's referring to Christianity, who's seeing that these powerful emotions can become destructive and, and Nietzsche agrees. They then declare war on the passions, right? And he says, on account of the folly inherent in it, one conspired for its extermination. All the old moral monsters, meaning all of the old moral philosophers, which he refers to here as monsters, are unanimous that il faut tuer les passions, we have to kill the passions. And then he goes on quoting uh, a text from Christianity, right, and so forth. So this is the first thing, right? So two points here. Number one, he agrees with Christianity that the passions can be dangerous. If, if we do not know how to navigate our passions, they can, they can devour us, right? A second thing he says, Christianity addressed this issue by destroying everything, <laughs> right? No more passions. So we don't learn to navigate, we just destroy, right? And that's where Nietzsche is, is uncomfortable. So he continues, I'm on, uh, let's see, where am I? Right. I'm just going to continue reading. The most famous formula for doing this is contained in the New Testament, in the Sermon of the Mount. There, for example, it is said, if thy eye offend thee, pluck it. But if you start to lust after someone with your eyes, just pluck your eyes out and you'll be fine. Right? True. Uh, and then, uh, fortunately, right, he's being sarcastic. No Christian follows this prescription. And now you underline this, to exterminate the passions and desires merely to do away with their folly this itself seems to us an acute form of folly. So he's saying this is not the way forward, right? To repress, to exterminate, to castrate us is not the way forward, right? Um, so the question is, of course, what is then the way forward that Nietzsche proposes, right? We are dealing with powerful emotions. How do we navigate those, right? Without becoming, right? Christianity just says, don't feel, don't look, don't touch. That, that's, the, that's the answer. Now, it doesn't even work, right? If, if someone tells you, don't look, what are you going to do? You're going to look. If someone tells you, don't touch, what are you going to dream of doing? Touching, right? So he's saying this approach doesn't even work, right? We, the passions get more overpowering when you put a, you know, a forbidden sign, right? Anything forbidden becomes much more attractive, right? So what, how can we navigate these passions? And Nietzsche is going to offer us three um, this is where he's being constructed, right? He's going to offer us three main ways of, of doing so. Now, before I get there, I want to respond briefly um, to, uh, to his criticism, right? From the standpoint of Christianity, right? So on the one hand, yes, there is a tendency in Christianity to forbid us from entering life, 
That's true. Anyone who's been to Catholic school or Protestant school, right? <laughs> you know that there is a tendency in Christianity to forbid entry into life. Don't do this, don't do that, don't look at this, don't touch that, don't touch yourself, don't do this, don't, right? And everything seems to be, everything you want to do, you can't, <laughs> right? So, but um, what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is that although this applies to Christianity as it is practiced in many uh, places, it does not apply to the founding text of Christianity, right? So I want to look at that a little bit. I want to look at the Gospels, right, which are the founding texts um, of Christianity. And for those who don't know what the Gospels are, right, the Gospels are simply uh, the stories uh, or the uh, accounts, narr narrative of the life and teachings of Jesus, right? When you read, there's four Gospels, four different um, uh, perspectives. Right? These are four different authors who simply talk about in, this, uh, in their work, in this, uh, in, in this story, they talk about the life and the teachings of Jesus. Right? Now, these are the founding texts of Christianity. Right? Jesus is the founding figure. His teachings and his life are really what should orient Christianity. And what I'm going to show you right now is that when you read these texts, you don't find what Nietzsche is seeing in traditional Christianity. Okay, let me say that again, right? When you read the founding text of, of Christianity, the Gospels, right? You start to read seriously. You find that these texts escape the Nietzschean critique. What, what Nietzsche is criticizing, you can't find in these texts. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Very powerfully, there's two examples I'm going to give you. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask if any of you know uh, what was the very first miracle that Jesus did ever, <laughs> right? Before healing anybody, before, you know, changing, you know, multiplying bread, walking on water, there is one miracle. Excellent, Sly and Campbell. Very good. Okay, we have a few learned people here. <laughs> very good. The marriage at Cana. Exactly, right? So Jesus hasn't started yet. And he has a few disciples already, but he, nobody knows who he is. Uh, and his mother uh, was invited at a wedding. So she brings him along with his friends and they're all, you know, chilling at the wedding and it's going well, it's good. But all of a sudden, right, the, the wedding hosts run out of wine. Now this is catastrophic. This is the equivalent of, you know, I don't know, running out of music, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the, what do you do now? You know, nothing. The party's over. It, it, it just falls to pieces, right? And you look bad. You look cheap, right? So the mother of Jesus, who's, you know, connected to the wedding party, she, she probably helped organize. She's completely besides herself, right? So she goes to Jesus and she's like, they have no wine. <laughs> and he looks at her and he's like, so? <laughs> How does this apply to me? And she doesn't even say anything. She turns to the servants and she says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And then she walks away. Crazy. Now Jesus is like, okay, fine. I guess I have to do something. So he looks at the servants and he says, what do you have? You don't have wine, but what do you have? They said, well, we have four, we have several large, uh, uh, what do you call those? Um, mm, somebody help me. It's like big jars. We have several large jars of water. He's like, okay, take these jars, uh, fill them up, all of them with water and serve the guests. And they're like, okay. <laughs> so they do that and they, they bring the big jar and the, the master of the MC, right, begins to pour the, the water and out comes, guess what? Wine, right? Changes the water into wine. Now, just the story about a wedding party, changing the water into wine, what does it tell you about early Christianity? <laughs> or at least about the teachings of Jesus? Is he against passion or is he for passion <laughs> based on that story? What's your impression of Jesus? Is he somebody who would be like, don't feel? <laughs> or exactly, right? De La Torre says, doesn't mind the party, right? Jesus seems to be somebody who's um, very, we say in French, bon vivant. He, he enjoys life. He's at a party. He wants the wine to keep flowing he wants he's a, he's at a celebration of sexuality so all of these passions right you have gluttony there you have you know lust you have uh, greed you have sloth party right all of these right jesus seems to be somebody who enjoys life 
who is who has entered life and is absolutely enjoying himself there right he's not afraid of life he, he's not afraid of enjoying life right so so when you look at the founding figure of christianity right and cancino excellent right like dionysus this is an excellent connection which nietzsche himself makes right? remember dionysus guys he's the god of wine intoxication parties jesus in this founding miracle is presenting himself like dionysus right he's closer to dionysus in this miracle than apollo and this is why, uh, by the way, Cancino, that was a good intuition. At the end of some of the texts in Nietzsche, he seems to merge Jesus with Dionysus. He finds the two to be perhaps one and the same, right? Same spirit, at least, right? Same, um, same message, right? So here you have at the very beginning a very different picture. You have a celebration of sexuality. You have a celebration of gluttony. You have, you know, sloth at a party. You have all of these right? Enjoyment of life. Life is not seen as sinful that we have to avoid, right? So now, when you continue to, to read a little bit um, and, and, and follow a little bit in the footsteps of Jesus in the Gospels, you notice that he is really, when he's faced with human desire, what does he do, right? What does Jesus do when someone comes and says, I want, I desire, I need, What's his reaction? Does he say, calm down, <laughs> right? go and pray? <laughs> what does he say? What is his response to human passion and desire? Those who know. Is he negative or positive about it? Is he telling people, no, no, don't, don't, don't want that? want only god i would say he doesn't condemn people for um feeling the way that they feel okay not only that but he responds people come to him and say heal me and he heals them right so this is very interesting we exactly rodriguez right he obliges in other words here we have them i want you i want to stop on this because this is a very powerful moment right when faced with human desire and passion jesus who is supposed to be right uh a manifestation of divine love, right? Instead of saying, uh, 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 you can't come near me with all of those human passions, he responds, right? And, and, and what, so that's the first thing. What we realize, we, we realize two things here, right? Whenever Jesus is faced with a human desire, he, he obliges and responds and heals or, you know, uh, whatever is asked of him. We see two things here. Number one, we notice that what we're learning here is that God is a being who responds to human desire, who doesn't despise human desire, who understands the human desire to enter life fully, right? And who opens a way, right? Jesus in a way is a gatekeeper uh, between a person who is living a stunted, limited life and their full entry into life. This is what we are seeing over and over again. Let me say it again, Jesus as a gatekeeper, the person comes to him, he has a limited small life because of his illness or mental illness or sickness or handicap. And Jesus, what he does, opens the door and says, go, live fully, be fully yourself, enter life fully, right? So that's the first thing we learned. It's very similar to the lesson of the book of Job, of God saying, please be my guest, live, <laughs> right? Enter life. That's the first thing we learned. Second thing we learn is that human desire, passion, can be a path to God. Instead of being a path away from God, which was what we are taught in Christianity often, it can be a path to God. Our human passions, as we see in the Gospels, bring us to God, right? They, they pull us out of ourselves. We want this so badly that we, are, we bring ourselves in the presence of one who can perhaps respond, right? So, this is very powerful. What we're seeing here is that human passion can become a path to God, right? Um, human anger, human desire, human greed can become paths to transcendence, right? So that's the second thing we see. So you can see, and there are many, many more ways to respond from the Gospels, right? But you can see clearly that whatever Nietzsche is saying about Christianity doesn't apply to the Gospels. The figure of Jesus is actually someone that Nietzsche might be sympathetic to, right? They are in a way very similar. So <clears throat> now, so what happened to Christianity? Why did it start moving away from this, 
the Gospels, right? Why did Christianity become so anti-life when you see Jesus constantly not only enjoying life, but being a gatekeeper for others so they can join, right, the dance of life? Why, why did Christianity turn into the opposite and start saying, ah, 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 don't enter life, no, no, psh, psh. <laughs> right? Don't touch that, don't look at that. What happened? And the key here is the Greek infiltration, right? Make sure you write this down. What happened to Christianity, why it started to part ways with Jesus, with the teachings of Jesus, was because Christianity started to become influenced by the Greek context in which it was born, right? Christianity, remember, was born at the time where the Greeks were, in, I mean, the Romans were in charge politically, but the Greeks were in charge culturally, right? So everyone spoke Greek. So Christianity started to part ways at the moment that it allowed the Greek influence. And the Greek influence, if you're familiar with Greek texts such as Plato or even the Gnostic writings, you see constantly this dualistic dichotomy. The world is bad, what matters is the spiritual realm. The body is bad, what matters is the soul, right? There's a constant separation between the material realm, the world, the body, the emotions, and the spiritual realm, the forms, the ideals, right, and so forth. And so what happened in Christianity was the infiltration of Greek thought, and with it, the hatred of the world, right? Greek thought, especially Greek Platonic thought, the thought of Plato, is very much antagonistic to what Plato calls the material realm, right, which he assimilates with the cave, cave life, right? So that's what really Nietzsche is after, right? It's my belief that what Nietzsche is really criticizing is not so much Christianity as the Greek elements of Christianity. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? Um, just wave at me if you're seeing what I'm saying, right? So, so when you really look at the founding texts of, um, of Christianity, such as the Gospels, you don't find these problems that Nietzsche is highlighting in Christianity, right? These problems, why? Because these problems came later under the influence of Greek thought, Christianity started to part ways with the world. <laughs> this is not in the Gospels. In the Gospels, we have Jesus telling people, go live, <laughs> right? Live fully here, let me help you, <laughs> right? But in Greek, because of the Greek infiltration into Christianity, you have this growing hatred of the world and walls begin to be erected between the Christian and the world and we're not supposed to enter, we're not supposed to touch, we have to rise above. This is not the teachings of early Christianity, right? Okay, now, in the time we have left, which is three minutes before I take a break, <laughs> let's look at Nietzsche's, um, so clearly we're not gonna, Nietzsche has just de destroyed the Christian approach to the passions. So what does he propose, right, to deal with these overwhelming emotions? Because they can get overwhelming, right? So he proposes three things. I'm gonna write them down. He says the spirit, we need to spiritualize them. Number two, we need to beautify them. And number three, we need to deify them. Okay, so he says this here in the text when you read from the bottom of page 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, this is his suggestion. He's talking uh, to the church and he's saying the church never asks. Um, uh, where is it? Um, yeah. How can one spiritualize, beautify, deify a desire, right? Never ask that. It only destroys. It doesn't, it doesn't give alternatives to how to navigate our passions. And Nietzsche is giving us three ways that we can navigate or channel our passions. We can spiritualize we can beautify, and we can deify these passions. So let's stop on that a little bit and see what does he mean. So what does it mean to spiritualize a passion? What do you think? How would you spiritualize overwhelming anger or overwhelming desire for someone? How would you spiritualize it? What do you think? Okay, so Simone suggests to connect it to something deeper. What do you mean? Can you give us an example? Like, you mean in a negative way or a positive way? A positive way, right? Nietzsche is saying, how do we spiritualize positively uh, a passion that's overwhelming, like anger, overwhelming anger, or overwhelming desire or lust, right? 
like connecting it to God, figuring out a way to, but I know Nietzsche doesn't believe in. Right. So how would you do it then? <laughs> Without God? You can't use God in the equation. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, I would say um, anger can turn into action. Very good. Right. We have right now a lot of anger, right? In our country. So we can either destroy everything, right? Like some people have chosen to do. And that's where Nietzsche is saying, no, this, this, is, this is too out of control. Right? But we can also channel the anger into political action, right? Um, so that's one way to spiritualize it. You, you channel it in a way that it becomes high, not low. Yeah, like purifying it. Yes, exactly. But the passion itself, he says, is neither good or bad, right? Passion itself is just a force, but it can either go bad or good. The passion can bring you down or it can bring you up. It can become overwhelming anger and destructive anger, or it can become action for change, right? So to spiritualize is to elevate, right? Kind of like when you have, a, okay, let me not give this example because I might get mixed up, but in chemistry, you know how you have a sublimation, you have the way that you can, I don't even know how it works. So let me not bring this. Anybody done chemistry with the, uh, the sublimation uh, in the, I don't even know the name of that thing. Um, putting on gallery view who took chemistry and you did the process of sublimation so you can help me with this metaphor did anyone take chemistry in this class <laughs> you aren't you supposed to take chemistry to graduate what's a, what, what what kind of education <laughs> okay so forget it then uh, okay bernard did but does this like me so forget about the example okay so this is simply you elevate your passion to spiritualize the passion is to elevate it into something positive instead of allowing it to destroy you you use that energy and you channel it into something positive that's what he means to spiritualize right or suppose you're you, you you're very romantic right and you get obsessed right with with you know someone how could you elevate that passion uh, instead of stalking them and killing them, what could you do? What would be the alternative? <laughs> Nobody knows? Being friends with them. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to help. If you're really obsessed, is that going to help? Um, I mean, Maybe creating something. Creating order. Uh, Bernard, go ahead. Maybe uh, creating, using all that passion for creativity. Exactly, right? You can use that energy and be creative, right? There are, I mean, sexual energy can be incredibly creative, right? If you channel it. So you can rechannel that energy. We don't know that. We think we have to, you know, endure this. No, the energy can be channeled into, you know, I don't know, poetry or, or some kind of action or, you know, you can or create, create something or even pursue a career with that energy. It's going to work, right? Actually, in, in, uh, in India, it's believed that um, if you're familiar with Indian culture, you know that people um, the, the, in the traditional Indian culture, you're not allowed to have sex until you get married, right? And so that energy that you have at 15 or 16 years old that is like boiling over, they tell you, use that to, to get an education. <laughs> use that to get a career. Channel it and become successful, and then you can get married. So this is really the technique, and it works because you are able to take that raw energy, which is overpowering at the age of fifteen and sixteen, and channel it into your education, your career, and you you know you make the energy so powerful, you make it real fast instead of wasting it, right? And then of course you're allowed to marry, right? In traditional Indian culture, this is the idea, right? I mean, I'm not suggesting you do the same as Indian culture, but this is one way, right? That this one example right, of spiritualization of the passion. Okay, now, beautify. You should know how this works based on my lecture on the birth of tragedy when I talked about Apollo and Dionysus. Uh, beautify means how do you transform your passion into a work of art? Hmm. So you make it beautiful. Instead of it being, ah, dragging you into all kinds of, you know, dark alleys, you make it beautiful. How do you make a passion beautiful? <clears throat> What's beauty? Let's ask this. What is beauty? Based on what I told you last time, um, on Nietzsche's uh, ex explanation of what makes an, a work of art. Yes, everybody remembers. <coughs> All right. Remember, beauty is the combination of the Dionysian and the Apollinian forces. 
you bring the two together and you have something beautiful. You bring powerful inspiration and you bring order, right? It's the same with our passions, right? When you bring the passion into order, you make it moderate, right? So in other words, what Nietzsche is saying is that a passion becomes beautiful when it is experienced in moderation, when it's not all over the place, when you have found a way to master it, not repress it, master it, right? So in other words, he's saying the passion itself is beautiful. You shouldn't have to, you know, exterminate it. It's like a wild horse, right? You have a wild horse. Horse is out of control. Horse is destroying the vegetable the garden, right? Do you kill the horse? No, <laughs> right? You tame the horse. You harness the horse. You master the horse. That's how we should be with our passions. They're like wild animals, which are right now destroying all the garden, but you don't kill it for that. You just learn to control it. Be moderate. This is the Greek ideal of beauty moderation when everything is in harmony when everything fits together nothing is in excess that's beauty right and ugliness is when you have excess right huge nose or too tall <laughs> right or big face <laughs> right big ears right this is excess that's not beautiful according to the greeks right so when everything is perfectly together that's beauty so that's what he's saying with our passions we need to learn not to kill them like the wild horse but to master it right harmonize it make it moderate live your passion in moderation that then it will be beautiful if you live your passion in excess you'll be ugly <laughs> if you live your passions in moderation you're angry but not too angry you're lustful but not too lustful you're slothful but not too slothful at that moment it will look elegant you will be practicing your passion with elegance Everybody understands the second point? Put your hand. Okay, so that's the second one, right? So if you have a passion, make sure you do it with a certain finesse, refinement, elegance. Don't be in excess. If you love to drink, drink moderately. If you love to have sex, have sex moderately. If you love to, you know, lazy around, lazy around moderately. If you have an anger problem, be angry moderately. This is the idea. Right. Okay. Now the last one is to deify the passions. What does that mean to deify a passion? To make it into a God. What is he doing? What's the, what's the meaning of that? Anybody know? Maybe to hold them to a high standard. Very good. Yes. Uh, whereas Christianity demonizes the passion, makes it low, perverted, corrupt. Nietzsche is saying, no, our passions are like gods, Greek gods. They're forces within us. They're beautiful, powerful, wild forces that bring us to do heroic, beautiful things, right? So he's saying, instead of seeing the passions like demons, let's see our passions, let's celebrate our passions, let's see them as gods. And remember, the Greek gods were, were powerful forces more than anything. They were forces that act in our lives, right? So he says, let's see these passions as powerful wild forces that, that, that enhance our life, that, that make us uh, reach for something higher than where we are right now, that help us rise above mediocrity, right? Okay, excellent. All right, any questions before we take a short break? Any questions? All right, let's take, it's 5.25. Shall we meet again at like, uh, do you want five minutes or three minutes? What do you prefer? Okay, how many people want three minutes? Two people, how many people want five minutes? Okay, more people. Okay. We'll take five minutes until 5.30. Now it's four minutes, by the way. <laughs> five minutes, I mean, till 5.30, and then we, we come back together.